thanks everyone for coming today. I sort of see you as shadows because of that light. I may end up this with a, with a tan myself. There's a lot of light in here on my face. But uh, yeah, <clears throat> so uh, the subtitle of this presentation could be, as you can see from the picture, na 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 na, because the idea is that uh, sometimes we, we can try as much as we can and teams will just not get on, boarding, uh, on board with the idea of uh, threat modeling. So first of all, who am I? My name is Izar Tarandash. I am a senior staff engineering at Datadog. I've been doing the security thing for a long, 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 long time. And uh, lately I've been focusing mostly on uh, modern STLCs, how to put things like Agile together, how to get processes in place so that they can support uh, secure development and secure design. And uh, now I'm looking into the thinning border between observability and security. Expect more on that. One of, uh, if not the call for, uh, for fame, is that I am the lead dev for PyTM, which is one of the first, if not the first, threat modeling from with as code you choose um, tools out there. And uh, if you happen to like PyTM or the idea of PyTM, uh, stickers are available. So <laughs> if, you, if you have space on your notebook or something, let me know. Uh, I am also the co-author of a book, a Riley book, called Threat Modeling, a Practical Guide for Development Teams, where the great Matt Coles and I uh, try to put some of this stuff that uh, we've been practicing and, and trying out uh, in text form so that people can uh, learn and get something out of it. And I am a very proud member of the Threat Modeling Manifesto Working Group, together with Chris sitting there in the back. In the back. And uh, we even got a sh shout out from uh, Jim this morning, so happy. <clears throat> of course, the standard dis disclaimer applies. My views are mine, not my employers. They don't pay me for that. And uh, all the art that you can see here is courtesy either of uh, gratis Gratisography or the IMG creator. So. What are we talking about today? So this is about applying soft skills to the big practice of threat modeling, meaning you, we are not talking about the soft skills while doing threat modeling. That's something that, if you want more details, you can look at uh, uh, some of Adam Shostak's presentations. He has great material on that on how to apply soft, soft skills while you're doing it, while you're talking to teams, while talking to people. Uh, now we are looking a bit on the higher level of that. How do we get people behind this whole threat modeling idea thing? If you're sitting here, I want to believe that by now you agree with me that threat modeling is a good thing, right? So this is the point where we raise hands. How many of you today actively do threat modeling in your environments? <laughs> okay, let's go with occasionally. Good question. Okay, occasionally and actually, okay. Anyway, I got at least more than half the, the room. So that's already a, a plus. So we're going to briefly take a look at why I believe that they're good, just to level set everybody. But the point is that some organizations do have difficulties. And by organizations, I, I'm going from the top down to the pair programming people all levels, at some point, they look at threat modeling and say, eh, not for me. Variety of reasons, we're going to look at some of them. But uh, the idea is, if you fall into one of those scenarios, if you have an organization at any level that's saying no to threat modeling, what can you do? And what I'm trying to do here is not bring you a list of suggestions, but try to bring you into the places where I experienced this where I saw this and what I tried to change the situation, what, what worked, what worked a, a bit less. So just to situate everybody, how did I get here and why do I think that I have any kind of double quotes authority to talk about this stuff? It all began actually not in 2018. It all began in 2010. I was uh, at the Product Security Office at EMC. And my boss, Rini Sondi, came to me with an interesting challenge. The way that the, the PSO, the Product Security Office, worked is of all the products of uh, 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 EMC, 
we had a bunch, a very small bunch of uh, security consultants. Each one of us got a bunch, a very big bunch of products for ourselves. And we automatically became the security champions for those products, right? And the idea that she had was she wanted me to come up with a threat model as a service thing. Do you know what? Sounded good. Sounded like a great challenge. And it sounded like something that could have some real impact, right? So you go home and you start thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking. And I think it's safe to say hundreds of products they had. No, not many hundreds, but more than 100. Teams all over the place, all over the, 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 the world. With that, different cultures. Teams that were separated geographically. Teams that didn't even have the same organizational structure. Some of them had, had architects, some didn't. Some of them had uh, staff engineers, some didn't. And to try and bring it all into, into a way that you could, as a service, provide threat modeling to each one of these different teams at the different rhythms that they worked, with the different environments that they had, all those constraints, and respond with, we have five people to do all these threat models, turned out to be very much impossible, right? And that's when it became clear to me that threat modeling is inherently an activity that happens at the level of the person coding. To say that again in, different, in a different way, if you are coding today in the environments that we have today, DevOps, libraries, all that good stuff, frameworks, all that good stuff, you are inherently do, making security decisions at every step of the way. And each one of those has a value for threat modeling. So we are out of that very waterfall-based model where you had one person doing all the design decisions and then bringing, cascading them down to the team, and they would merrily go and just execute whatever they, they were being told to. Today, you have those things that happen in real time, and somebody has to make a decision in real time, and those impact the, the threat model. So in 2018, I came up with this, <coughs> basically, rant, where I looked at the, the, the number of CVEs that we were seeing ever since we started counting them. And even though we started having great tools, great uh, guidance, great documentation, great frameworks and all that, that number of CVEs just kept going up. And my conclusion at the time was, it's not that we got better at finding CVEs. It's just that even though we have all this stuff, we are not using it right. And things are just, they keep happening again and again and again and again. So in this one, I said, hey, we have to train people differently. We have to give them uh, security fundamentals rather than how-tos. And we have to lead them through the idea that if you develop, you are a security person. And that brought me to 2019, threat model every story, which is my personal motto. I think that the only resolution that we can actually impact day-to-day -day development with a threat model is if that threat model gets changed every time that something that needs to change happens in real time. In other words, if you're a developer, you got a new story, take it, look at it, does it have any kind of security value? If it doesn't, throw it away, just not throw it away, do it and move on. If it does have some security value, then hey, update your threat model. That's all, simple, right? It's not that simple, but it's simple. So that was my, my big one. In that one also, I introduced what I came to call CTM, continuous threat modeling, a methodology to do exactly that, threat model every story. Then <laughs> came PyTM, a tool. You write code, you get a threat model. But it also came that kickback. What do you mean threat model every story? Who has the time for that? Who has the resources for that? Who knows that? Threat modeling is, is black magic. Not everybody can do it, right? And this was my, no, everybody can do it. And here's how. And here are some tools. And here are some resources that you can use. And yes, it's doable. And then comes, OK, 
your team is doing it. That's awesome. You have the security team, you have your team, threat modeling is happening, you are even doing the continuous thing one way or another. But how does that translate across the organization? How, how does that go up? At this time, I was in uh, Autodesk, and Autodesk had 250 products, one security team. How do you scale that threat modeling? So at that time, we had already some numbers of applying continuous threat modeling to those, those teams. And uh, we were able to come in, present those, those numbers, show where the, the whole idea fell, things that broke, and how we fixed it, or how we tried to fix it. Shortly after that, again, with the great Matt Coles and, uh, and me at DEF CON, we decided to look a bit less on the threat side of things and more on the modeling. Why is it that teams sometimes say, I don't want to do a, a data flow diagram. I don't want to do a sequence diagram. These things are hard. These things take time. So wh what is so bad about modeling a system, especially when the system already exists? That's another barrier of entry to threat modeling that we looked at. And just a month or two ago, the Open Security Summit, I put forward this question to a number of people uh, attending. How is it that you fail a threat model? What causes your threat model to fail? Right? Two different questions, but interesting answers. And then I put everything together, and that's what I'm bringing to you guys today. Now, each one of these is uh, on YouTube. Feel free to take a look if you're interested. So back to the thing. We know that threat models are good. In my opinion, first of all, because they give you clarity, especially today. Uh, I recently changed uh, jobs. And as soon as I got to the new one, I asked, OK, how do things happen here? What's the big design? What's, how, how do parts come together? And somebody put in front of me a diagram. And I looked at it, and I saw that it was good. In other places, I did not have the same experience. I had people explaining to me, oh, we can't really do a diagram because, you know, there are some parts of it that are a black box, and the people who wrote it are not here anymore, and we try not to touch it just in case it breaks. So <laughs> not really a good idea, right? But the practice of, of creating a threat model, both the modeling and the threat, they help give you clarity on top of things, how they work. You, have, you find deviations from design, what uh, I, I call the Eureka moments. That's the time when the whole team is discussing the, the the system and the chief architect is going on and on and on about how good how things are good and then at the end of the the room some guy some guy throws his hand up and say you know what that is the design but because of the library abc we had some constraints and we had to change the thing around and you know it's not like that anymore and all of a sudden boom things become clear and people notice that yeah we we have a problem here that we may need to look at the next thing is threat models help with a bunch of stuff. They help identify and mitigate issues at design time, whatever design time may be, whenever it happens. They identify constraints that you have around the, the development. Sometimes you can use this technology, you can't use that one. Sometimes you can de deploy here, but you can't deploy there. Threat models will help you figure that out. They help in other categories. They, a threat model won't give you just security stuff. It will tell you about resiliency. It will tell you about uh, uh, testing, about monitoring, things that are related in parallel to security, but that can benefit from the information that comes from a, a good threat model. And you know, when we talk about this DevSecOps thing, if you want everybody talking one language, if you want everybody looking at the same thing, Having a threat model is a great same thing for everybody to look at, because it explains what your system is, how it was built, the things that uh, you wonder about, is this going to be working tomorrow? And really focus everybody around the same campfire, so to say. Everybody is speaking the same language because they are looking at the same thing in the middle. Now, perspectives on threat models. We have, first of all, us, security practitioners. We know what we're doing. We like threat models. And we can turn to something like the Threat Modeling Manifesto and even see a definition that we all can come together behind. 
Uh, it's analyzing representations of a system to highlight concerns about security and privacy characteristics. The words are big. The idea, very simple. We are all looking at the same thing. We are thinking about security. We are looking, uh, thinking about privacy. And we are trying to bubble up issues that may touch those two things. Now, <clears throat> together with that, the Threat Modeling Manifesto adopted, if you guys haven't seen it yet, I heartily recommend. Uh, the Threat Modeling Manifesto adopted what has been known forever as the four questions by Adam Shostak. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that every single time that I look at these four questions jumps to me is how Adam managed to get something that we can talk about hours and hours and hours, write books, presentations, whatnot, and bring it down to four lines of short text that basically explain the whole thing. What are we working on? What's this thing that we're building? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And did we do a good enough job? We answered these four, we have a threat model, and a good one, probably. Now, this is how it looks for us. It's simple, it's good, it gives results. Yay, let's go, let's do it. How does it look for them? It looks like work. It looks like unclear work. It looks like stuff that's going to dilate the way that they're doing things. It looks like one more thing that they have to do before they can actually go and write nice code that turns into nice web pages, that turns into a nice service, and everybody is happy. This is basically the thing that we have to overcome when we are trying to sell threat modeling as a practice. OK, so two big questions on how we fail on this. We can fail to threat model, and our threat, threat models themselves, once done, can fail. Let's try and answer the first one. How do we fail to threat model? People come to you and say, hey, this thing is too costly. It's taking time out of people. That time costs money. It's too long. Forget the money. It's just taking too long. The system is developing, and the threat model is developing, and each one of them developing either in a different direction or at different speeds. It is too difficult. We have to bring consultants to do this thing. And the consultants don't know the system. Or we have this tool that does it, but the tool works in a certain way. And we have to learn the tool. And we have to learn the way that the tool works. And we have to adapt everything. It's too difficult. There's too much process. It is too conceptual. You're asking me to look at a design and imagine, oh my god, what could possibly go wrong. I write lines of code. I don't want to think about this conceptual stuff. It is to security, right? You need somebody who actually knows security to talk about security, because if they don't security, then security doesn't security the secure thing that is insecure because it has no secure, right? Or management simply doesn't see the value. If you're telling me that you're going to get my whole development team, put them aside for a non-negligible amount of time, it's going to cost me a non-negligible amount of money, and what's going to come out of it? More work. So what have we achieved? Engineering. Oh. True, and, and that's a great solution. And in fact, I think that it's an approximation of what Microsoft said to do with their normal loop when they said, hey, the agile way of doing this thing is to get one, one sprint ever, ever so often and do it a threat modeling sprint, right? So it, it's a bit more of an approximation of that, and it, it's an almost end step towards threat model every story. So yeah, I, I would totally go there with you. Right. 
Yep, yeah, true. So back to the list, and thank you for the question. Uh, engineering doesn't see the value. And that happens more times than you could imagine. They will go through the motions. They will do everything that security asks them to do. And at the end of the process, they'll look back at you and say, why did I do this? I, I already knew all this stuff. You didn't add anything in there. <clears throat> Many times they'll come to you and say, hey, we already scan our code and we already pen test. And we already do all these other automatic things. Why, why do I need one more security thing? I think that by now all of you already know the answer. <laughs> and include reason age. Everybody has their own. The point that I put it in there is that, uh, frankly, and, and I know that I am extremely biased to say this, I have not yet heard one reason why it shouldn't be done. I heard many reasons why it should be done differently, totally. And that's part of, of this talk. But I have not heard one single reason why threat modeling should not be taken as a practice. So let's say that they agreed and they did a threat model. Yay. Now, how does a threat model by itself, once done or once enduring, fails? If they do not bring value, the threat modeling uh, manifesto approaches that in two lines. They do not lead to improvement in the security posture, meaning, yeah, you went through the motions, you did the whole thing, but now you are not in a better place than you were before. You don't know more stuff about your security than you did before. So basically, you forgot to bring value. And you enter the uh, anti-pattern of the hero threat modeler. Instead of taking your whole team and getting all of them involved in the process of threat modeling. What you did was you called Joe and said, Joe, you are my senior developer here. You know where all the skeletons are buried. Why don't you go for a week and come back with a threat modeling? It's the, the, the Moses in the mountain thing. He went out, he took everything he knew about the system, he brought it back. And you know what? That's a threat model of a system as seen by one person. And if anybody in here is familiar with the uh, parable of the elephant and the three blind men. I'm not going to go into details, but what they expressed is what they see in there. It does not mean that it's the total of the system. Then you have the admiration for the problem, meaning somebody got that task or a team got that task of that uh, threat model, and they kept staring at it and staring at it and being so engrossed by how we do this thing, how do we start, how we do and we know that we finished, how do we know that it was good, that they end up with something that is more of a, a we really, really tried than an actual threat model. A failing threat model does not express threats at all. So they come back to you and say, we are perfect. We own this thing. It's all good. It's not going to break. Best system ever. Uh, doesn't happen. So if that's the answer that you got, somebody forgot something. Or they do not express the right threats, which the threat model manifesto refers to as a tendency to overfocus. You get the latest, shiniest thing that came out of wherever it is. I re if you guys remember, there was a, a, a time where everybody was looking for side channel attacks and stuff like that. Why? Because it was the sexiest kind of attack that you could. Meanwhile, you're not looking for XSS, you're not looking for C-Surf, a lot of other stuff that, you know, probably is going to be attacked before that other thing happens. So you tend to overfocus into something that's probably not relevant to you or less relevant to you, and you forget to look at the whole other 80, 90% of stuff that is relevant to you. If you have a threat model that does not represent the system, and that goes together with the uh, hero tra threat modeler, which is it's one per person's uh, view of the system, not everybody's, or you fall into the perfect representation anti-pattern, there is no perfect representation of a system, especially a living one. Oh, but wait, my system has been in place for 20 years and nobody touches it. What happens? That must be a, a, a perfect representation. There's a very close perfect representation. But the things around your system, I'm willing to bet, keep changing. 
where it's deployed, who is it talking to, what kind of data is going into it. Old libraries that have new findings. So yeah, as much as that thing is like frozen in time, things that are related to it keep changing. And you have to go together with that. You have to keep changing the way that your model is represented to go together with changes in time. <clears throat> and dead threat models. These are usually triggered by governance efforts. There is a box somewhere in a form saying, you have to have a threat model before you, you go out. And somebody goes and writes a pretty document and call, call it a threat model, checks the box, the document goes into a, 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 a desk drawer and only turns up next time that they have to do another one because they are deploying again. So that, to me, is the saddest one because people put, put effort, put time and money in there and did not get absolutely any value of it apart from that check in a checkbook. Oh, and the last one, of course. Your threat model is not my threat model. <laughs> uh, a sentence that a lot of people like to use in very different contexts. And many times, two people were taught saying the same thing, but not meaning exactly the same thing. But the, the fact is that sometimes, and this is something that I see a lot, people will say, hey, I was asked to create a threat model for my system. Can I look at yours? Yeah, you can, sure. You can be educated by it, you can learn about my system by it, but that's not going to be your threat model. You're not just going to change the name <laughs> on the top and automatically that's going to become your threat model. A threat model is something that's extremely focused on whatever it is that we are building, if you refer back to the four questions, right? So to just go ahead and get something that remotely looks like and say, oh, that's mine, I'll just change the name of the boxes, a couple of data flows and everything's good, Probably not. So make sure that your threat model is your threat model. So what is the problem that we are trying to solve here today? What, what's the thing that I'm trying to bring to you guys? Now that we know how threat models fail, and now that we know how we can fail to threat model. The problem, again, is organizations, teams, and even developers that don't want to threat model. Now, I put the want in big letters there just because it uh, strikes like stronger. But the fact is that uh, there are some who can't do it as well. Now, uh, this URL here is uh, an attempt of mine to get out of the uh, writing to security people and instead write to developers. This site here, leaddev.com, if you don't know it, awesome site. Seriously, they, they have amazing stuff there. But it's more about engineering than security. They do have security content, but it's more like this. And in this blog, I, I, I try to write a bit about my experience as a security practitioner, as a security consultant, as a security, big quotes, champion for teams, and what I experienced trying to move them along uh, their security journey. And uh, <clears throat> in there, I just put it out, you know, this thing is like selling insurance. Nobody wants to buy. Nobody wants to pay the costs. But as soon as something happens, they do want to get the good part of it. And by adopting the perspectives of the decision makers, we can grasp how they're likely to perceive our plans and attempts at persuasion. Meaning, if you want to convince something to do something that they are really, really, really against doing because of any of those reasons that we, we went through, the first step to actually changing their minds is not creating a better argument because they are set where they are. In my opinion, the first step is to put yourself in their place. Why is it that they are feeling it? Why is it that they, are that they think that they are under these constraints? If they really are under these constraints, what can I do to help them move away from them? Do I have to go one level up? Do I have to show a different way of engaging the whole thing? And that's called perspective taking. Uh, I am very lucky to be uh, married to a professor in uh, a business. And uh, she pointed me towards perspective taking when I started telling her 
what is it that I'm doing with people that I have to convince and what kind of argument I'm bringing to the table? And she said, oh, you know what? That actually has a name. And if you go and get informed and learn a bit more about it, you're probably going to be a bit more effective on it. And amazingly, as wives do, she was right. So once I tried to apply perspective taking to my security practice, what was it that I figured out? That the first step was to tailor the pitch, which is marketing 101, right? You want to convince someone. You want to start talking in the, the language that they want to, to hear, that they, they are used to, to hear. So you avoid doom and gloom. You don't go and you say, oh my god, if you don't have a threat model, horrible things are going to happen. The company is going to fail. The stock is going to tank. And uh, you have to have one, right? You run away from that. It just puts people on the defensive. You don't want to, to deal with that. You show them that there are some things that come together with this goodness that the threat model brings to security, which again is the clarity, is the inclusion, is getting everybody's voice represented in what the system is, what it does, and what are the bad things that could happen to it. So in terms of the, the, uh, the team around the system, you get good things out of doing it. Uh, another thing on that note, uh, Brooke Schoenfeld, another person in threat modeling that you guys should know by now. If not, go do it. He says that uh, one of the worst experiences that he has is when people, when he goes to threat model something and people think that he, are, uh, that he is criticizing the design. And I believe that in conversation we came up with this thing that you have to make it very clear to them that you are not going to criticize the design. You are going to help them make that design, whatever it is, whatever your opinion of it is, more resilient, more secure. So basically, you're not criticizing the design. You're just saying, hey, this thing here could be made different, and it would be so much better for everybody. <clears throat> then you have to translate into what they have to gain apart from security, which again goes to the resiliency, to the monitoring, to the auditing, stuff that is, again, ancillary and connected to security, but it's not security per se. It's not, I'm saving you from cross-site scripting. It's, I'm giving you a framework that you can use to make other efforts around the system better. Clarify to them that threat modeling is an evolutionary activity. Many times people are afraid of threat modeling because they say, what if I get it wrong? Am, am I actually writing a contract saying, my security is good apart from these things which I'm, I'm going to mitigate when I can, and these are the problems that I have identified. What if I forgot a big problem? What is this going to say about me? What is this going to say about the product? What is this going to say about the team? By telling them, hey, listen, this is an evolution thing, right? Today, you don't have a threat model. Do one. It's going to be a bad one. It's already better than not having one. You're going to learn things from it. You're going to learn things about your system. You're going to learn things about threat modeling. You're going to learn things about threat uh, threats. Just go ahead, do it. Tomorrow, you do it better. So explain to them that it's, it's a moving target. It's not a point in time thing that you are basically taking a, a, a stand and saying, this is the security status of my thing, and nothing beyond this is going to ever happen. Do you have a tool of preference that you use? A tool of preference that you use? Yep, that too. Okay. Do you, do you have one oh, me? <laughs> Later. Okay. <laughs> the second step is to manage both sides of the conversation. So. This is the tricky part, because it's hard. We, we are security people. We are opinionated. We've been doing things a certain way for a certain time. We have very clear opinions about what's good, what's bad, what's in between. And now I'm telling you, forget all that. Put yourself into their place. Consider the things that you are asking them to do and how much it's going to ask them, uh, to, to cost them to actually do it. Okay? That's going to help you tailor a message in terms of that cost and in terms of the effort that you're asking them to make and how to get closer to them in that discussion. Find that, that middle, 
middle space, that middle point where perhaps you can't really agree, but it's very hard to disagree because you asked for something, you gave something. <clears throat> Ask yourself if you're suggesting all threats and mitigations or the right threats and mitigations. And what I mean by that is, and some people are going to take this the wrong way, I'm, I'm sure, but it's the reality of the thing. There is such a thing as too much security. <laughs> Not everything is Fort Knox. Okay? You don't have to defend everything like the crown jewels. Sometimes you can be down here and that's enough. So recognize that and whenever you're tailoring the pitch, make sure that you are selling the right size of security and not the most absolute security thing that you can ever imagine. Suggesting solutions rather than giving instructions. Again, you're taking their perspective. They are going to be, and by they I'm using a very, very generic developer archetype to talk, okay? People usually are less responsive to someone telling them, this is how you're going to do it. Because there is a, 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 an understanding of, this is how you're going to do it because I know better than you. And I don't know if you guys ever saw a developer. They don't like that kind of thing. <laughs> eh? So tell them, hey, here's a suggestion. This is how you could do this in a secure way. Can you find the way to make that fit your view of the world, your model of the system? So telling them, I've seen this work in a different place. It was very similar to yours. It's not exactly the same one. So you're going to have to do some thinking. You're going to, to, to have to adapt this to your reality. But here's something that I saw working. That gives them just the right amount of information for them to start their own journey into what is their solution. You also get ownership out of it. It's not, oh, that thing broke. The security guy told me to do it. It's like, oh, that thing worked. Yeah, because I got the thing that the security guy said, and uh, hey, it works. Fun for the whole family, right? And at the end, finding the right time to push. Hint. It is not when everybody is running around because the system doesn't work for some completely unrelated reason. It is not two weeks before deployment. It is definitely not during Hack Week when everybody is trying to do their pet project. Finding the right time to push is one of those things that's going to be extremely dependent of the organization itself, of the timing of the project, <laughs> even the temper of the people involved. Right? They, they will have their own rhythm, and you're going to have to identify that rhythm and insert yourself into it. So find the right time to come and, and put your thing on the table. But OK, so I talked a, a lot, and I moved my hands around a lot. But what am I actually telling you guys worked for me? I was in an organization. I tried everything I could, some things that I even don't agree with. There was no threat modeling being done. So first thing that I did was that I tried to meet them where they actually are and not where I want them to be. I completely stopped the thing of, guys, you have to threat model. No. Guys, it's OK. You're doing your thing. Awesome. Let's go there. Let's see what we can take out of it. Every organization has some kind of document, an RFC, a design document, an architectural review, whatever, that basically, devi uh, basically uh, defines what is it that's going to be built or what's already being built, and basically where the, the discussions happen, where people comment on the document or they have a meeting and stuff. If the organization that you, don't, that you are don't have that, there are many who are hiring, so you have other problems than threat modeling. But most of them do have something like this. Make use of that thing to add the template with a very simple question. What could possibly go wrong? 
Now, it's a very simple question. But if you notice, even that simple question, in, in the way that you ask it, and, and I'm talking, the, the tone that you use has a very different meaning. A security person will look at a design and usually in a very um, almost cynical tone of voice, they'll say, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, do these guys even know what they're doing? On the other hand, the developer will look at the same design and say, what could possibly go wrong? It's the simplest thing ever, right? There's nothing here that can break. These are parts that talk to each other and things happen and it's a good product. What could possibly go wrong? So when you ask that question, keep in mind, it's you as a security person asking, but it's them as developers answering. So make sure that when you read those answers, you are reading with the right approach. You are reading with the approach of someone seeing somebody say, I don't know what could go wrong. I don't think that there's anything that could. Do not overload the question with URIs, references, checklists, whatever. Why? Because now you're taking the focus away. You're taking the focus from that simple line, what could possibly go wrong? And you are giving them a library of stuff to look and be overwhelmed by. If you can't, if they are going against what you want in terms of, I can't do that, do not overload them. But would you prompt that question anyway? Like, look at a few dimensions like data, surface, you know, things that are important in your organizational context? Okay. <laughs> so let's jump the one with the, uh, someone with security background in there for a second. And let's go to your question. Uh, if nobody beat, okay, nobody came and said, yeah, there's something that could, could go wrong, or we looked at these things and they look fine for us, then start seeding it. Start asking the questions yourself. Start going a bit deeper. But again, no checklists, no URI, nothing. Hey, have you guys looked at the authentication of this thing? Have you imagined what could happen if server A went down? Guys, have you looked at the identification of this object? Is that something that you could guess? Is that something? And if somebody guesses it, what happens? What happens if I guess the identifier of that, that call? Uh, guys, do we really need to ask for this kind of information? Do we need to store it? So on and so forth. So you're giving very simple prompts to start a conversation. That's your, your final ob uh, objective. You want to start that conversation. When that happens, by the nature of the work, by the nature of the people that they are, developers will notice, hey, I don't know enough about this stuff to be, to be able to answer that. And that will get them to start their journey. So lead them there, push gently, and look for the results. The previous bullet, make sure that there is someone of security background around. Is it a must? No. If you can, have it. If you can have someone in there who's going to, hey, you know what? I know a bit about this stuff, so yeah, why don't we look at it in a certain way? <clears throat> and remember, the final point of the exercise is not to provide answers, but to elicit questions. It is harder to start people asking than for them to give you answers. Think about that for a second. If you ask a developer a question, they will have an answer. But if they don't know even the questions that they need to, to be asked, then you have a bigger problem. Finally, have a place where people can come and build on those questions. If you have a Slack channel where security people can hang out and answer stuff. If you have uh, open hours. If you have your personal email, okay? Tell them, hey, you know what? If you're thinking about this stuff and something comes up, drop me an email. I'll answer, right? Make yourself available and make them welcome. Don't make them feel like they are going to someone who is a guru sitting on top of a mountain, just waiting for the masses to come with their questions. Make them feel welcome. Make yourself available. This is an example of one that I used uh, recently. This thing was there in the middle of uh, uh, an RFC. Now, I'm going to be extremely uh, honest with you. What I'm not showing is the last line, 
that did have a bunch of URIs, a bunch of pointers, pointer to books, to whatever. I removed that stuff because I learned that it's not useful. People would come to me and say, hey, I started looking at that stuff, and all of a sudden, three hours passed, and I hadn't answered one single question. I did not know one new thing to ask, and my other work did not get done. So I'm sorry, this thing is too time consuming. That's when I learned that, no, overloading that stuff, not a good idea. And it happened more than once. Now, as we get to the end here, I want to start leaving you with one big, 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 big idea, which is emergence versus emergency. The emergency here is I did not think of all the things that could go wrong. One of them surfaced, beat me. Now I'm running around, my head on fire. Nothing's working. People are screaming at me. What do I do? The other one is actually emergence. Just by asking that one simple question, one of the four of Adam's questions, repeatedly, at different levels, at different times, first, you are going to be known as a very, very boring person because you keep asking the same question. But over time, you are going to improve the way that people think about their systems. You are going to improve the questions that they ask. You are going to improve the answers that they give. How you win? How do you know that you did something right and, yes, something better is happening? First of all, people are going to ask unprompted questions. You're, you're not going to have to prod people. Somebody is going to come out of the, the dark, out of the blue, and say, hey, I was thinking about this thing. Uh, do you think that this is something that could go wrong? Smile to yourself, two thumbs up, you won. The question happening during one part of the discussion, and um, we're discussing this part of the system here, all of a sudden, somebody is going to say, hey, but wait, doesn't that apply to this part of the system here? You got people to understand the question and the answer. You won. People start asking, how can I ask better questions? People are going to start asking, where can I find security training? They'll ask, where is the threat model for X? Not because they want to copy it, not because they want that to be their threat model, but because, to, because they want information that's in there that's going to inform their threat model. There's going to be complaints that there's too much information being generated and that nobody knows how to capture that stuff. That's when you really, really want. Because that's the point in the life of that organization that they are asking you to create a repository of threat models, a template that people will use to put all that information that's being generated. And then all the other questions get answered by having that. People will be able to search that repository. People will be able to find information. People will be able to say, hey, somebody has not touched this threat model in two weeks, and the system has completely refreshed. Somebody has to look at this. That's when you really know that you won. Takeaways, I love this picture because, first of all, I did it, and second, uh, because I really consider that the threat model is a hanger for many of the other activities in the SSDOC. You want to inform your secure design, of course, you need a threat model. You want to look at your implementation in more detail, understand how that system actually works. Your threat model is there for you. You want to do better security testing. Hey, what are the things that I identified as possible threats to my, to my system? Those are probably good things to start testing. You want to check your deployment. You want to talk to DevOps people and say, hey, this is how I need this thing, this thing to be deployed. These are the permissions. These are the resources, so on and so forth. Your threat model is there to inform you. <clears throat> you can make it work. Like everything in life, it's going to take effort. It's all about understanding your customer. And many times, it is about understanding who your customer is. Sometimes you think that it's the developer. Many times, it isn't. So you have to read that situation. You have to figure out who is it that you are there to serve. You can't force people to threat model. But you can't show them that they are already doing it without knowing. Again, the evolutionary thing, set the expectations. 
Let people know you don't expect perfect, perfection right away. It's going to take time. It's a process. It's going to take learning. But you will get better at it. Bad threat model is better than no threat model at all. Many different reasons. Don't get hang up in the process. As somebody who has published a methodology, I'm going to go, <laughs> go forward and tell you, read it, be informed by it, don't be constrained by it. Read about the different methodologies and go out, there's a lot of different methodologies out there. Find the bits and pieces that work for you in your organization. Develop your own. Find the thing that works for you. Sounds complex? Not really. If I, if I can do it, anybody can do it. But do take that time. As practitioners, find the way that threat modeling works for you and understand every time that you change organizations, development teams, whatever, frameworks, you will probably have to adapt that way that it works for you. So find your own style, find your own methodology, use it. Turn threat modeling into a verb. Don't say, give me a threat model. Say, hey, let's threat model this thing. It's a difference in approach that takes something absolute, a package called a threat model, and you just made it something that happens in a continuum. Let's iterate over this thing and come out with a list of findings. Let's threat model. And simple questions can lead to complex answers and are easy to ask. What can possibly go wrong? Foster and model curiosity. Don't let people say, oh, that's not interesting. If your security funny bone is tingling, if your Spider-Man sense is tingling, there is probably, probably something interesting in there. So keep people curious. That's going to lead them and by itself be a, a, a uh, an end game to the process of discovery. Thank you very much. A couple of uh, resources. We have the Threat Modeling Manifesto. We have uh, Matt's and, and mine book. There is one by Brooke that I think that it's, it's really mandatory, that's uh, Securing Systems, Applied Security Architecture and Threat Models. We have the one that started it all with uh, from Adam. This one is a really good one because it covers the whole SSTLC in uh, modern ways. So it looks at the agile thing. It looks at how you can get those things up to the speed that you actually want to. And here in the end, we have Secure by Design, which is really, really a good read on how to apply secure design patterns to your development. Questions, anything? I believe I have six minutes more. So here's the thing, okay, and, and let me prefix this by saying one thing. I have huge respect for people who write threat modeling tools. Huge. They are there helping popularize things, make it accessible, make it organized. Unfortunately, the way the tools are today, the state of the art where we are today, to me, it's like driving forward, looking on the rear view mirror. You have this set of rules, this set of things, and those are the ones that you're going to find. So if you fixate on a tool, on the output that the tool is going to give you, and uh, consider that the whole thing, you are missing a whole lot of what threat modeling can give you. So I would say, use the tool that best fits the way that you work. Don't let the tool tell you how to work. But once you have the answer from that tool, expand on it. Don't just print that report, and again, it's a dead threat model, goes in the drawer, that's it. Look beyond what the tool is giving you. Many of the tools, like many of the other security tools that we have seen along the years, are going to give you false positives. So learn to figure out those. The Microsoft Threat Tools is a good example. It's, it's a great tool, 
It's, it's really something that I would give to somebody who's just beginning. But it's going to give you 300 times the same thing just because you happen to have one data flow that doesn't have HTTPS. OK, so no tool today, to my knowledge, is able to give you the whole thing from A to B. And remember, threat modeling is a conceptual process. So hard rules are not going to give you all the results that you want. Yeah. Anything else? Hmm? Nope. OK, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. So um, you made a point about suggesting solutions instead of giving instructions. But when developers aren't security experts and not all security experts have been developers, how do you actually ensure the correct implementation? That's, that's a great, great, great question. Thank you. Security testing is a thing in many different forms. So my personal approach is if I'm giving a suggestion, I try to give that packaged. If I'm telling you, hey, use library XYZ to do, I don't know, output sanitization, but then run the tests with, hey, these payloads here, and try to see what happens. So verify that the library actually does what it says it does. If I'm giving you something that's a bit more to your system, a bit more elaborated to your business uh, case, let's say. So the threat here is at a higher level than a library or a, or a data flow or something like that. I would try to come to you with the abuse cases that would prove that that thing, that whatever mitigation you suggested, actually happened. And you can translate that into tests. Okay, so by giving the suggestion, try to give it packaged as a full thing, not just throw something in their face and say, now deal with it. So then when you look to structure the feedback loop for how good of a job did we do, um, how do you actually link that back to like the threats and countermeasures that were identified in the other side of providing this abuse case? Another great, great question. <laughs> so my personal interpretation of, of that last question is more of a meta thing. Let's look back at the process of threat modeling and see if it worked better. But what you're saying is perfectly valid. How do I know that the threat, and correct me if I'm interpreting you wrong, how do I know that the threat model actually brought value? Right. right? That's, what the, that's what the business wants at the end right. of it, right? They want to say, was this a valuable investment of time? And can I prove that this resulted in a quantifiable reduction in vulnerabilities or reduction in risk? Like, the business speaks risk. Yep. So when we can bring that back to, hey, this exercise that we did resulted in X number of reduced vulnerabilities compared to uh, whatever we were doing before, or, or not doing, before, or whatever that past threat model was like. So here's the thing: <laughs> what you're trying to do is parallel to proving a negative. There is a universe of vulnerabilities in there. I did something that universe now is a very small set of galaxies. That's basically impossible to prove. But if you look at the results of tests, and here I'm throwing threat modeling as an activity happening in a system that already exists and that there is already a framework around it. If you look at tests before and after, and you can say, OK, before I had a lot of findings on cross-site scripting. And then during my threat modeling, I came up with, of course, for us obvious, but for, for others less, that cross-site scripting is a problem. And that because of the frameworks that we use, either there is some flag that we can turn on, or there is some filter that we, we can put in, some library that we could, can put in there, and all of a sudden, all the good things that need to happen for cross-site scripting to go away happened. And now we don't see cross-site scripting at all. So by changing the design, or by changing some of the elements of the design, we completely obliterated one class of findings. And believe me, there are enough the way that I say is everybody can do it. No, not everybody can do it. But there are enough examples out there of times when it was done. And those are the times when you see that, hey, we completely changed the, 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 the landscape here because threat modeling identified one change in design that's able to obliterate that whole kind of, of bug. So you're not speaking in terms of hard quantities. You are speaking in terms of. I'm giving you time and resources to focus on other things because you don't have to look at these things. Right? So that's one way of explaining. 
Another problem here is, and this could be a talk by itself, you have findings on a threat model, now you have to order them. What do I do before? Oh, let's talk risk. No, let's not. Let's definitely not, okay? Because risk is probability times impact. You don't know what the probability is, you can only guess what the impact is. Let's talk priority, okay? What are the things that, with a security point of view, are more important for you to fix now than those others? Have a clear story of why are those more important, which could be based on the exposure of the things behind that thing, um, how close it is to the top of the attack surface. Uh, again, one fix fixes 10 of these. So I probably want to put some time into this before I do the one outlier case here that needs its specific thing, right? So try to find fi factors that are important to you that explain what the priority of each one of the findings is and keep banging on those, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.